extracts supplied by a sub-sub librarian. It will be seen that this mere painstaking burrower and grub worm of a poor devil of a sub-sub appears to have gone through the long Vatican's and street stalls of the earth, picking up whatever random allusions to whales he could anyways find in any book whatsoever, sacred or profane. Therefore, you must not, in every case at least, take the higgledy-piggledy whale statements, however authentic, in these extracts for veritable gospel cetology. Far from it as touching the ancient authors generally, as well as the poets here appearing, these extracts are solely valuable or entertaining as affording a glancing bird's eye view of what has been promiscuously said, thought, fancied, and sung of Leviathan by many nations and generations, including our own. So fare thee well, poor devil of a sub-sub, whose commentator I am. Thou belongest to that hopeless, sallow tribe, which no wine of this world will ever warm, and for whom even pale sherry would be too rosy strong, but with whom one sometimes loves to sit and feel poor devilish too, and grow convivial upon tears, and say to them bluntly, with full eyes and empty glasses and in not altogether unpleasant sadness. Give it up, sub-subs, for by how much more, how much the more pains ye take to please the world, by so much the more shall ye forever go thankless. Would that I could ever clear out Hampton Court and the Tuileries for ye, but gulp down your tears and high aloft to the royal mast with your hearts, for your friends who have gone before are clearing out the seven-storied heavens and making refugees of long pampered Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael against your coming. Here ye strike but splintered hearts together. There ye shall strike unsplinterable glasses. And God created great whales. Genesis. Leviathan maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Job. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Psalms. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah. And what thing soever besides cometh within the chaos of this monster's mouth, be it beast, boat, or stone, down it goes, all incontinently, that foul great swallow of his and perisheth in the bottomless gulf of his paunch. Holland's Plutarch's Morals. The Indian Sea breedeth the most and the biggest fishes that are, among which the whales and whirlpools, called baleen, take up as much in length as four acres or arpens of land. Holland's Pliny. Scarcely had we proceeded two days on the sea, when about sunrise a great many whales and other monsters of the sea appeared. Among the former, one was of a most monstrous size. This came towards us, open-mouthed, raising waves on all sides, and bearing, beating the sea before him into a foam. Fux Lucian, The True History. He visited this country also with a view of catching horse whales, which had bones of very great value for their teeth, of which he brought some to the king. The best whales were catched in his own country, of which some were forty-eight, some fifty yards long. He said that he was one of six who had killed sixty in two days. 
other or others verbal narrative taken down from his mouth by King Alfred, A.D. 890. And whereas all other things, whether beast or vessel, that enter into the dreadful gulf of this monster's whale's mouth are immediately lost and swallowed up, the sea gudgeon retires into it in great security and there sleeps. Montaigne. Apology for Raymond Sebon. Let us fly, let us fly. Old Nick, take me if it, if it, um, if it's not Leviathan described by the noble prophet Moses in the life of Page and Job. Rabelais. This whale's liver was two cartloads, Stowe's annals. The great Leviathan that maketh the seas to seethe like boiling pan. Lord Bacon's version of the Psalms. Touching that monstrous bulk of the whale or orc, we have received nothing certain. They grow exceeding fat, inasmuch as an incredible quantity of oil will be extracted out of one whale. Ibid, History of Life and Death. The sovereignest thing on earth is parmaceti for an inward bruise. King Henry. Very like a whale, Hamlet. Which to secure no skill of leech's art, mote him avail, but to return again to his wounds worker, that with lowly dart, dinting his breast, had bred his restless pain, like as the wounded whale to shore flies through the main, the fairy queen. Immense as whales, the motion of whose vast bodies can in a peaceful calm trouble the ocean till it boil. Sir William Davenant, preface to Gondibert. What spermaceti is, men might justly doubt, since the learned Hosmanos, in his work of 30 years, saith plainly, Nescio quid sit, Sir T. Brown, of spermaceti and the spermaceti whale, vide his V.E. Like Spencer's talus with his modern flail, he threatens ruin with his ponderous tail. Their fixed javelins in his side he wears, and on his back a groove of pike appears. Waller's Battle of the Summer, Summer Islands. By art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state, in Latin civitas, which is but an artificial man. Opening sentence of Hobbes Leviathan. Silly Mansoul swallowed it without chewing, as if it had been a sprat in the mouth of a whale. Pilgrim's Progress. That sea beast Leviathan, which God of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream. Paradise Lost. There Leviathan, hugest of living creatures, in the deep, stretched like a promontory, sleeps or swims, and seems a moving land, and at his gills draws in, and at his breath spouts out a sea, Ibid. The mighty whales, which swim in a sea of water and have a sea of oil swimming in them, Fuller's profane and holy state. So close behind some promontory lie, the huge leviathan to attend their pry, and give no chance but swallow in the fry, which through their gaping jaws mistake the way. Dryden's Annus Mirabilis. While the whale is floating at the stern of the ship, they cut off his head and tow it with a boat as near the shore as it will come but it will be aground in 12 or 13 feet water. Thomas Edge's 10 voyages to Spitsbergen in purchase. In their way, they saw many whales sporting in the ocean and in wantonness, fuzzing up the water through their pipes and vents, which nature has placed on their shoulders. Sir T. Herbert's voyages into Asia and Africa, Harris Collection. Here they saw huge troops of whales that were forced to proceed with a great deal of caution for fear they should run their ship upon them. Shelton's sixth circumnavigation. We set sail from the Elbe, wind northeast in the ship called the Jonas and the Whale. 
Some say the whale can't open his mouth, but that is a fable. They frequently climb the mast to see whether they can see a whale, for the first discoverer has a ducat for his pains. I was told of a whale taken near Shetland that had above a barrel of herrings in his belly. One of our harpooners told me that he caught once a whale in Spitsbergen that was white all over. A Voyage to Greenland, AD 1671 Harris Collection. Several whales have come in upon this coast, Fife, NO 1652, one 80 feet in length of the whalebone kind came in, which, as I was informed, besides a vast quantity of oil, did afford 500 weight of baleen. The jaws of it stand for a gate in the garden of Pitfarren, Sibbald's Fife and Ken Ross. Myself had agreed to try whether I can mass buster and kill this sperm suddy whale, for I could never hear of any of that sort that was killed by any man, such is his fierceness and swiftness. Richard Strafford's letter from the Bermudas, Phil Trans, AD 1668. Whales in the sea god's voice obey. N. E. Primer. We saw also abundance of large whales, there being more in those southern seas, as I may say, by a hundred to one than we have to the northward of us. Captain Cowley's Voyage Round the Globe, A.D. 1729. And the breath of the whale is frequently attended with such an insupportable smell as to bring on a disorder of the brain. Uloa's South America. To 50 chosen sylphs of special note, we trust the important charge, the petticoat. Oft have we known that sevenfold fence to fail, though stuffed with hoops and armed with ribs of whale. Rape of the Lark. If we compare land animals in respect to magnitude with those that take up their abode in the deep, we shall find that they will appear contemptible in the comparison. The whale is doubtless the largest animal in creation. Goldsmith, Natural History. If you should write a fable for little fishes, you would make them speak like great whales. Goldsmith to Johnson. In the afternoon, we saw what was supposed to be a rock, but it was found to be a dead whale, which some Asiatics had killed and were then towing ashore. They seemed to endeavor to conceal themselves behind the whale in order to avoid being seen by us. Cook's Voyages. The larger whales, they seldom venture to attack. They stand in so great dread of some of them that when out at sea, they are afraid to mention even their names and carry dung, limestone, juniper wood, and some other articles of the same nature in their boats in order to terrify and prevent their too near approach. Unifon Troil's Letters on Banks and Salander's Voyage to Iceland, 1772. The spermaceti whale found by the Nanakwa is an active, fierce animal and requires vast address and boldness in the fishermen. Thomas Jefferson's Whale Memorial to the French Minister in 1778. And price, sir, what in the world is equal to it? Edmund Burke's reference in Parliament to the Nantucket whale fishery. Spain. A great whale stranded on the shores of Europe, Edmund Burke, somewhere. Tenth branch of the king's ordinary revenue, said to be grounded on the consideration of his guarding and protecting the seas from pirates and robbers, is the right to royal fish, which are whale and sturgeon. And these, when either thrown ashore or caught near the coast, are the property of the king, Blackstone. Soon to the sport of death, the crews repair. Rodman unerring, or his head suspends the barbed steel and every turn attends. Falconer's Shipwreck. 
Bright shone the roofs, the domes, the spires and rockets blew self-driven to hang their momentary fire around the vault of heaven. So fire with water to compare the ocean serves on high, up sprouted by a whale in air to express unwieldy joy. Koopa on the Queen's visit to London. 10 or 15 gallons of blood are thrown out of the heart at a stroke with immense velocity. John Hunter's account of the dissection of a whale, a small sized one. The aorta of a whale is larger in the bore than the main pipe of the waterworks at London Bridge. And the water roaring in its passage through that pipe is inferior in impetus and velocity to the blood gushing from the whale's heart. Paley's theology. The whale is a mammiferous animal without hind feet. Baron Cuvier. In 40 degrees south, we saw spermaceti whales, but did not take in any until the 1st of May, the sea being then covered with them. Colnett's voyage for the purpose of extending the spermaceti whale fishery. In the free element beneath me swam, floundered and dived, in play, in chase, in battle, fishes of every color, form, and kind, which language cannot paint, and mariner had never seen. From dread leviathan to insect millions, peopling every wave, gathered in shoals immense like floating islands, led by mysterious instincts through that waste and trackless region, though on every side assaulted by voracious enemies, whales, sharks, and monsters, armed in front or jaw, with swords, saws, spiral horns, or hooked fangs. Montgomery's world before the flood. Eo, pan, eo, sing to the finny people's king. Not a mightier whale than this in the vast Atlantic is. Not a fatter fish than he flounders round the polar sea. Charles Lamb's Triumph of the Whale. In the year 1690, some persons were on a high hill observing the whales spouting and sporting with each other. When one observed there, pointing to the sea, is a green pasture where our children's grandchildren would go for bread. Obed Macy's History of Pawtucket. I built a cottage for Susan and myself and made a gateway in the form of a Gothic arch by setting up a whale's jawbones. Hawthorne's twice told tales. She came to bespeak a monument for her first love who had been killed by a whale in the Pacific Ocean no less than 40 years ago. Ibid. No, sir, tis a right whale, answered Tom. I saw his spout. He threw up a pair of as pretty rainbows as a Christian would wish to look at. He's a real rat, oil, but that fellow, that's Cooper's pilot. The papers were brought in and we saw in the Berlin Gazette that whales had been introduced on the stage there. Eckerman's conversations with Goethe. My God, Mr. Chase, what is the matter? I answered, we have been stove by a whale. Narrative of the shipwreck of the whale ship Essex of Nantucket, which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large sperm whale in the Pacific Ocean by Owen Chase of Nantucket, first mate of said vessel, New York, 1821. A mariner sat in the shrouds one night. The wind was piping free. Now bright, now dimmed was the moonlight pale and the phosphor gleamed in the wake of the whale as it floundered in the sea. Elizabeth Oak Smith. The quantity of line withdrawn from the boats engaged in the capture of this one whale amounted altogether to 10,440 yards or nearly six English miles. Sometimes the whale shakes its tremendous tail in the air, which cracking like a whip resounds to the distance of three or four miles, Scoresby. Mad with the agonies he endures from these fresh attacks, 
the infuriated sperm whale rolls over and over. He rears his enormous head and with wide expanded jaws snaps at everything around him. He rushes at the boats with his head. They are propelled before him with vast swiftness and sometimes utterly destroyed. It is a matter of great astonishment that the consideration of the habits of so interesting and, in a commercial point of view, so important an animal as the sperm whale should be so entirely neglected or should have excited so little curiosity among the numerous, many of them confident observers that of late years must have passed the most abundant and the most convenient opportunities of witnessing their habitudes. Thomas Beals, History of the Sperm Whale, 1839. Cachula sperm whale is not only better armed than the true whale, Greenland or right whale, in possessing a formidable weapon at either extremity of its body, but also more frequently displays a disposition to employ these weapons offensively and in a manner at once so artful, bold, and mischievous as to lead to its being regarded as the most dangerous to attack of all the known species of the whale tribe. Frederick Devil Bennett's Whaling Voyage Round the Globe, 1840. October 13. There she blows was sung out from the masthead. Where away, demanded the captain. Three points off the lee bow, sir. Raise up your wheel. Steady, steady, sir. Masthead ahoy, do you see that whale now? Aye, aye, sir, a shoal of sperm whales. There she blows, there she breaches. Sing out, sing out every time. Aye, aye, sir, there she blows, there, 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 there she blows, bows, boos. How far off? Two miles and a half. Thunder and lightning, so near. Call all hands. J. Ross Brown's Etchings of a Whaling Cruise, 1846. The whale ship globe on board of which vessel occurred the horrid transactions we are about to relate belong to the island of Nantucket. Narrative of the Globe Mutiny by Lay and Hussey survivors, AD 1828. Being once pursued by a whale which he had wounded, he parried the assault for some time with a lance. But the furious monster at length rushed on the boat, himself and comrades only being preserved by leaping into the water when they saw the onset was inevitable. Missionary Journal of Tyreman and Bennett. Nantucket itself, said Mr. Webster, is a very striking and peculiar portion of the national interest. There is a population of eight or 9,000 persons living here in the sea, adding largely every year to the national wealth by the boldest and most persevering industry. Report of Daniel Webster's speech in the US Senate on the application for the erection of a breakwater at Nantucket, 1828. The whale fell directly over him and probably killed him in a moment. The whale and his captors or the whaleman's adventures and the whale's biography gathered on the homeward cruise of the Commodore Preble by Reverend Henry T. Cheever. If you make the least damn bit of noise, replied Samuel, I will send you to hell. Life of Samuel Comstock, the mutineer, by his brother William Comstock, another version of the whale ship globe narrative. The voyages of the Dutch and English in the Northern Ocean, in order, if possible, to discover a passage through it to India, though they failed of their main object, laid open the haunts of the whale. McCulloch's Commercial Dictionary. These things are reciprocal. The ball rebounds only to bound forward again. For now when Lane opened the haunts of the whale, the whalemen seem to have indirectly hit upon new clues to the same mystic Northwest passage from something unpublished. It is impossible to meet a whale ship on the ocean without being struck by her near appearance. The vessel under short sail with lookouts at the mastheads eagerly scanning the wide expanse around them has a totally different air from those engaged in regular voyage. Currents and Whalings, USXX. Pedestrians in the vicinity of London and elsewhere 
Where may recollect having seen large curved bones set upright in the earth, either to form arches over gateways or entrances to alcoves, and they may perhaps have been told that these were the ribs of whales. Tales of a Whale Voyager to the Arctic. It was not until the boats returned from the pursuit of these whales that the whites saw their ship in bloody possession of the savages enrolled among the crew. Newspaper account of the taking and retaking of the whale ship Hobomok. It is generally well known that out of the crews of whaling vessels, American, few ever return in the ships on board of which they departed. Crews in a whale boat. Suddenly, a mighty mass emerged from the water and shot up perpendicularly into the air. It was the whale. Miriam Coffin, or the whale fisherman. The whale is harpooned, to be sure, but bethink you how you would manage a powerful unbroken colt with the mere appliance of a rope tied to the root of his tail. A chapter on whaling in ribs and trucks. On one occasion, I saw two of these monsters, whales, probably male and female, slowly swimming one after another within less than a stone's throw of the shore, Terra del Fuego, over which the beech tree extended its branches, Darwin's voyage of a naturalist. Stir it all, exclaimed the mate as upon turning his head, he saw the distended jaws of a large sperm whale close to the head of the boat, threatening it with instant destruction. Stir it all for your lives. Horton, the whale killer. So be cheery, my lads, let your hearts never fail while the bold harpooner is striking his whale. Nantucket song. Oh, the rare old whale, mid storm and gale, and his ocean home will be a giant in might, where might is right, and king of the boundless sea. Whale Song.
Hello, and welcome to the 25th annual Moby Dick Marathon. I'm Amanda McMullen, President and CEO of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and we are so proud to continue this 25-year-long tradition, even if it's a little bit different this year. Reading this book together is something we look forward to all year. Togetherness is a vital part of who we are, and although we aren't physically in the same room or tucked into the corners of a gallery, we are together nonetheless. Moby Dick tells the story of a voyage full of beauty and madness unlike any journey before it. While this book is famed for many interpretations and meanings, I think we can all agree it speaks to the spirit of survival that we are all feeling this year, along with the steadfast hope we must have for brighter days. What we've been through this past year and what lies ahead will certainly inform new ways to interpret and connect to this story. Hopefully you've gotten comfortable at home with your copy of Moby Dick as you settle in for the ride. Make sure to check out our website at whalingmuseum.org for all our extra activities, including chats with the Melville Scholars, bonus lectures, and information on how to have a delicious Moby Dick-inspired meal delivered to your home. I'd like to thank the Melville Scholars from the Melville Society Cultural Project for their continued partnership, along with the Whaling Museum staff, volunteers, and our board of trustees. And of course, the hundreds of readers who braved the technology world and helped us continue this tradition virtually. I'd also like to recognize some very special readers this year, including Senator Edward Markey, Representatives Tony Cabral and Paul Schmid, Massachusetts Senators Mark Montigny and Michael Rodericks, and of course, our longtime supporter and friend, New Bedford Mayor John Mitchell. I look forward to taking this journey with you again over the next 24 hours. And without further ado, let's begin our voyage. Watch officer, please give me eight bells. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly no November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily passing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off. Then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew, almost all men in their degree, some time or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. There now is your insular city of Manhattos, belted round by wharves as Indian isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. Its extreme downtown is the Battery, where that noble mole is washed by waves and cooled by breezes, which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circumambulate the city of a dreary Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corley's Hook to Coenta's Slip, and from thence by Waterhall, Whitehall, northward. What do you see? Posted like silent sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men 
fixed in ocean reveries. Some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pier heads, some looking upon the bulwarks of ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging as if striving to get a better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen of weekdays pent up in lath and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they have? But look, here come more crowds, pacing straight for the water and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange. Nothing will content them but the extremest limit of the land. Loitering upon the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, they must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues. Inlanders all, they come from lanes and alleys, streets and avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compass of all those ships attract them thither? Once more, say you're in the country, in some highlands of lakes. Take almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries. Stand the man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead to water, if water there be all that, in all that region. Should you ever be athirst in the great American desert, try this experiment if your caravan happened to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, Meditation and water are wedded forever. But here is the, an artist. He desires to paint you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic landscape in all the valley of the Sacco. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk, as if a hermit or a crucifix were within. And here sleeps his meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up upon yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into distant woodlands winds a mazy way, reaching to overlapping spurs of mountains, bathed in their hillside blue. But though the picture lies thus tranced, and though this pine tree shakes down its size like leaves upon this shepherd's head, yet all were vain unless the shepherd's eyes were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June, when for scores on scores of miles, you wade knee deep among tiger lilies. What is the one charm wanting? Water. There is not a drop of water there. Were Niagara but a cataract of sand, would you travel two th your thousands to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly reaching two handfuls of silver, deliberate whether to buy him a coat, which he sadly needed, or invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust, healthy boy with a robust, healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to the sea? Why upon your first voyage as a passenger did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity and make him the own brother of Jove? Surely all of this is not without meaning, and still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who because he could not grasp the tormenting mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans. It is the image of the ungraspable phantom of life, and this is the key of it all.
Now, when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be overconscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. For to go as a passenger, you must needs have a purse, and a purse is but a rag unless you have something in it. Besides, passengers get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep at night, do not enjoy themselves much as a general thing. No, I never go as a passenger, nor though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore or a captain or a cook. I abandon the glory and the distinction of such offices to those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable, respectable toils, trials, and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself without taking care of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, and whatnot. And as for going as a cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer of sh on shipboard, yet somehow I never fancied broiling fowls. Though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and judgmatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully, nor to say reverentially, of a broiled fowl than I will. It is out of the idolatrous dotings of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bake houses, the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go as a simple sailor right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle, aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some and make me jump from spar to spar, like a grasshopper in a May meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is unpleasant enough. It touches one's sense of humor, particularly if you come from an old established family in the land, the Van Rensselaers or Randolphs or Hardicanutes. And more than all, if just previous to putting your hand into the tar part, you have been lording it as a country schoolmaster making the tallest boy stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, from a schoolmaster to a sailor, and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. But even this wears off in time. What of it if some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks? What does that indignity amount to? Weighed, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament. Do you think the archangel Gabriel thinks anything less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, however the old sea captains may order me about, however they may thump and punch me about, I have satisfaction knowing that it is all right that everybody else is one way or other served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is. And so the universal thump is passed round and all hands should rub each other's shoulders blades and be content. Again, I always go to the sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay. And there is all the difference in the world between being pay paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two orchard thieves entailed upon us. But being paid, what will compare with it? The urbane activity with which a man receives money is really marvelous considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly ills, and that on no account can a money man enter heaven. Ah, how cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition. Finally, I always go to sea as a sailor because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent than winds from astern. That is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim. So for the most part, the Commodore on the quarter deck 
gets his atmosphere at second hand from the sailors on the forecastle. He thinks he breathes at first, but not so. In much the same way do the commonality lead their leaders in many other things at the same time that the leaders little suspect it. But wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I show now, I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage. This is the invisible police officer Fates, who has constant surveillance of me and secretly dogs me and influences me in some uncountable ways. He can better answer than anyone else. But doubtless, my going on this whaling voyage formed part of the grand program of Providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came in as a sort of brief interlude and solo between more extensive performances. I take it that this part of the bill must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States whaling voyage by one Eshmael, bloody battle in Afghanistan. Though I cannot tell why it was exactly that those stage managers, the fates, put me down for this shabby part of a whaling voyage when others were set down for magnificent parts in high tragedies, in short and easy parts in genteel comedies and jolly parts in farces. Though I cannot tell why this was exactly Yet now that I recall all the circumstances, I think I can see a little into the springs and motives which being cunningly presented to me under various disguises induce me to set about performing the part I did, besides conjoling me into the delusion that it was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself. Such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. Then a wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk, the undeliverable, nameless perils of the whale. These with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds helped to sway me to my wish. With other men, Perhaps such things would not have been inducements. But as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail for forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I am quick to perceive a horror and could still be social with it. Would they let me be? Since it is but well to be on friendly terms with all the inmates of the places one lodges in. By reason of these things, then, the whaling voyage was welcome. The great floodgates of the wonder world swung open, and in the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, two and two there floated into my inmost soul. Endless processions of the whale, and the midmost of them all, one grand hooded phantom, like a snow hill in the air. Chapter Two the carpet bag. I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it in under my arm, and started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good old city of Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was on a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at this same New Bedford, thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing. For my mind was made up to sail in no other than a Nantucket craft. Because there was a fine, boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazingly pleased me. Besides, though, New Bedford has of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling. And though in this matter, poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket was her great original, the tire of this Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. 
Where else but from Nantucket did those aboriginal whalemen, the red men, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan? And where but Nantucket, too, did that first adventurous little sloop put forth, partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story, to throw at the whales in order to discover when they were nigh enough to risk a harpoon from the bowsprit. Now having a night, a day, and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious looking, nay, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew no one in the place. With anxious grapnels, I had sounded my pocket and only brought up a few pieces of silver. So wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the middle of a dreary street shouldering my bag and comparing the gloom towards the north with the darkness toward the south. Wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge for the night, my dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price and don't be too particular. With halting steps, I paced the streets and passed the sign of the crossed harpoons, but it looked too expensive and jolly there. Further on, from the bright red windows and from the bright red windows of the Swordfish Inn, there came such fervent rays that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice from before the house. For everywhere else, the congealed frosts lay 10 inches thick in a hard asphaltic pavement, rather weary for me, when I struck my foot against the flinty projections, because from hard, remorseless service, the soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly, again thought I, pausing one moment, to watch the broad glare in the street and hear the sounds of the tinkling glasses within. But go on, Ishmael, said I at last. Don't you hear? Get away from before the door. Your patched boots are stopping the way. So on I went. I now by instinct followed the streets that took me waterward, for there doubtless were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest inns. Such dreary streets blocks of blackness, not houses on either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving about in a tomb. At this hour of the night of the last day of the week, that quarter of the town proved all but deserted. But presently I came to a smoky light proceeding from a low, wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. It had a careless look, as if it were meant for the uses of the public. So entering, the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash box on the porch. Ha, thought I, ha, as the flying particles almost choked me. Are these ashes from that destroyed city, Gomorrah? But the crossed harpoons and the swordfish? This then must needs be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up and hearing a loud voice within, pushed on and opened a second interior door. It seemed the, gra the great black parliament sitting in Tophet. A hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer, and beyond a black angel of doom was beating a book in a pulpit. It was a Negro church, and the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing and teeth gnashing there Ha, huh, Ishmael, muttered I, backing out, wretched entertain entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light not far from the docks and heard a forlorn creaking in the air and looking up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting upon it faintly representing a tall, straight jet of misty spray. And these words underneath, the spouter in, Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? Rather ominous, 
in that particular conception, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an emigrant from there. As the light looked so dim and the place for the time looked quiet enough, and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked as if it might have been carted here from the ruins of some burnt district. And as the swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of creak to it, I thought that there was, I thought that here was the very spot for cheap lodgings and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place, a gable-ended old house, one side palsied, as it were, and leaning over sadly. It stood up on a sharp, bleak corner, with that tempestuous wind, Euraclidon kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Euraclidon, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors, with his feet on the hob quietly toasting for bed. And judging of that tempestuous wind called Euraclidon, says an old writer, of those works I possess the only copy extent, it marketh a marvelous difference, whether thou lookest at it from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest it from the shastless window where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is only the glazer. True enough, thought I, as this passage occurred to my mind, old black letter thou reasonest well. Yes, these eyes are windows, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they don't stop the, ch the chinks and the crannies, though, and thrust in a little lint here and there. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished. The copper stone is on, and the chips were crafted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow and shaking off his tatters with his shiverings. He might plug up both ears with rags and put on a corn cob into his mouth and yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Euraclidon. Euraclidon says old Deves in his red silken wrapper. He had a redder one afterwards. Pooh pooh. What a fine frosty night. How Orion glitters with northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climes of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them up to the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather than lay him down lengthwise along the line to ensure? The equator, yeah, ye, gods, go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep the frost out. Now that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone before the door of Deves. This is more wonderful than an iceberg should be more to the one of Maluculus. Yet Deves himself, he too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen size. And being a president of temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now. We're going to a whaling, and there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet and see what sort of place this spouter may be. Entering that gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry with old-fashioned wainscots reminding one of the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. One side hung this painting a, which is a very large oil painting so thoroughly besmoked and every way defaced that in the unequal cross lights by which you viewed it it was only by diligent study in a series of systemic visits to it and careful inquiry of the neighbors that you could in any way arrive at understanding of its purpose such uncountable masses of shades and shadows that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist in the time of the New England hags had endeavored to delineate chaos bewitched. But by dint of much and earnest contemplation and off repeated ponderings, and especially by throwing open the little window toward the back of the entry, you at last came to the conclusion that such an idea, however wild, might not be altogether unwarranted. 
But what most puzzled and confronted you was a long, limber, pretentious black mass of something hovering in the center. Something in the center of the picture over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines floating in a nameless yeast. A boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly. Enough to drive a nervous man distracted. Yet, was there a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity about it that fairly froze you to it? Till you involuntarily took an oath with yourself to find out what that marvelous painting meant. Ever an anon a bright, but alas, deceptive idea would dart you through. It's the Black Sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted health. It's a hyperborean winter sea. It's the breaking up of the ice-bound stream of time. But at last these fancies yielded to that one pretentious something in the picture's miss. That once found out, all the rest were plain. But stop. Does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish? Even the great Leviathan himself. In fact, the artist's design seemed this, a final theory of my own, partly based on the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed about the subject. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane. The half-founded ship weathered there with its tree three dismantled masts alone visible, and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft, is in this enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads. Chapter three, The Spouter Inn. The opposite wall of this entry was hung all over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. Some were thickly set with glittering teeth resembling ivory saws. Others were tufted with knots of human hair. And one was sickle shaped with a vast handle sweeping round like the segment made in the new mown grass by a long armed mower. You shuddered as you gazed and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever have gone a death harvesting with such a hacking horrifying implement. Mixed with these were rusty old whaling lances and harpoons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons. With this once long lance, now wildly elbowed, 50 years ago did Nathan Swain kill 15 whales between a sunrise and a sunset. And that harpoon, so like a corkscrew now, was flung in Javan seas and run away with by a whale years afterwards slain off the Cape of Blanco. The original iron entered nigh the tail and like a restless needle sojourning in the body of a man, traveled full 40 feet and at last was found embedded in the hump. Crossing this dusky entry and on through yon low archway, cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all around, you enter the public room. A still duskier place is this, with such low ponderous beams above and such old wrinkled planks beneath, that you would almost fancy you trod some old craft's cockpits, especially of such a howling night when this corner anchored old ark rocked so furiously. On one side stood a long low shelf-like table covered with cracked glass cases, filled with dusty rarities gathered from this wide world remotest nooks. Projecting from the further angle of the room stands a dark looking den, the bar, a rude attempt at a right whale's head. But that how it may, there stands the vast arched bone of the whale's jaw, so wide a coach might almost drive beneath it. Within are shabby shelves ranged round with old decanters, bottles, flasks, and in those jaws of swift destruction, like another cursed Jonah, by which name indeed they called him, bustles a little withered old man who, for their money, dearly sells the sailors deliriums and death. Abominable are the tumblers into which he pours his poison. Though true cylinders without, within the villainous green goggling glasses deceitfully tapered downwards to a cheating bottom. Parallel meridians rudely pecked into the glass surround these footpads goblets. Fill to this mark and your charge is but a penny, to this a penny more. 
and so on to the full glass, the Cape Horn measure, which you may gulp down for a shilling. Upon entering the place, I found a number of young seamen gathered about a table, examining by a dim light diverse specimens of scrimshander. I sought the landlord and telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that this house was full, not a bed unoccupied. But a vast, he added, tapping his forehead. You ain't no objections to sharing a harpooner's blanket, have you? I suppose you're going whaling, so you'd better get used to that sort of thing. I told him I never liked to sleep two in a bed, that if I ever should do so, it would depend upon who the hoopa harpooner might be, and that if he, the landlord, really had no other place for me, and the harpooner was not decidedly objectionable, why, rather than wander about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper? You'll want supper. Supper will be ready directly. I sat down on an old settle, carved all over like a bench on the battery. At one end, a ruminating tar was still further adorning it with his jackknife stooping over and diligently working away at the space between his legs. He was trying his hand at a ship under full sail, but didn't make much headway, I thought. At some four or five of us were summoned to our meal in an adjoining room. It was cold as Iceland. No fire at all. The landlord said he couldn't afford it. Nothing but two dismal tallow candles, each in a winding sheet. We were fain to button up our monkey jackets and hold our lips cups of hold to our lips cups of scalding tea with our half frozen fingers. But the fare was of the most substantial kind, not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings. Good heavens, dumplings for supper! One young fellow in a green box coat addressed himself to these dumplings in a most dire manner. My boy said the landlord. You'll have the nightmare to the dead certainty. Landlord, I whispered. That ain't the harpooner, is it? Oh no, he said, looking a sort of diabolically funny. The harpooner is a dark complexion chap. He never eats dumplings, he don't. He eats nothing but steaks and likes them rare. The devil he does, says I. Where is the harpooner? Is he here? He'll be here for long was the answer. I could not help it, but I began to feel suspicious of this dark-complexioned harpooner. At any rate, I made up my mind that if it so turned out that we should sleep together, he must undress and go into bed before I did. Supper over, the company went back to the bar room, when, knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the rest of the evening as a looker-on. Presently, a riding noise was heard without. Starting up, the landlord cried, That's the Glumpus crew. I seed her and reported in the offing this morning. A three years voyage and a full ship. Hurrah, boys. Now we'll have the latest news from the Fijis. A tramping of sea boots was heard in the entry. The door was flung open and in rolled a wild set of mariners enough. Enveloped in their shaggy watch coats, and with their heads muffled in woolen comforters, all bedarned and ragged, and their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears from Labrador. They had just landed from their boat, and this was the first house they entered. No wonder, then, that they made a straight wake for the whale's mouth, the bar, when the wrinkled little old Jonah, there officiating, soon poured them out brimmers all around. One complained of a bad coal in his head, upon which Jonah mixed him a pitch-like potion of gin and molasses, which he swore was a sovereign cure for all coals and catars whatsoever. Never mind of how long standing or whether caught off the coast of Labrador or on the weather side of an ice island. The liquor soon mounted into their heads, as it generally does, even with the Arantis toppers newly landed from sea, and they began capering about most obstreperously. I observed, however, that one of them held somewhat aloof, 
And though he seemed desirous not to spoil the hilarity of his shipmates by his own sober face, yet upon the whole he refrained from making as much noise as the rest. This man interested me at once, and since the sea gods had ordained that he would soon become my shipmate, though but a sleeping partner one, so far as this narrative is concerned, I will here venture upon a little description of him. He stood full six feet in height, with noble shoulders and a chest like a coffer dam. I have seldom seen such brawn in a man. His face was deeply brown and burnt, making his white teeth dazzling by the contrast, while in the deep shadow of his eyes floated some reminiscences that did not seem to give him much joy. His voice at once announced that he was a southerner, and from his fine stature, I thought he must be one of those tall mountaineers from the Allegheny and Ridge in Virginia. When the revelry of his companions had mounted to its heights, height, this man slipped away unobserved, and I saw no more of him till we became, he became my comrade on the sea. In a few minutes, however, he was missed by his shipmates, and being, it seems, a some for some reason a huge favorite with them, they raised a cry of, Bulkington, Bulkington, where's Bulkington? And darted out of the house in pursuit of him. It was now about nine o'clock, and the room seemed almost supernaturally quiet after these orgies. I began to congratulate myself upon a little plan that had occurred to me just previous to the entrance of the seaman. No man prefers to sleep to in a bed. In fact, you would a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they are sleeping. And when it comes to sleeping with an unknown stranger, in a strange inn, in a strange town, and that stranger a harpooner, then your objections indefinitely multiply. Nor was there any earthly reason why I, as a sailor, should sleep two in a bed. More than anybody else, for sailors no more sleep two in a bed at sea than bachelor kings do ashore. To be sure, they all sleep together in one apartment, but you have your own hammock and cover yourself with your own blanket and sleep in your own skin. The more I pondered over this harpooner, the more abominated the thought of sleeping with him. It was fair to presume that being a harpooner, his linen or woolen, as the case might be, would not be of the tidiest, certainly not of the finest. I began to twitch all over. Besides, it was getting late, and my decent harpooner ought to be home and going bedwards. Suppose now he should tumble in upon me at midnight. How could I tell from what vile hole he had been coming? Landlord, I changed my mind about the harpooner. I shan't sleep with him. I'll bet I'll try the bench here. Just as you please. I'm sorry I can't spare you a tablecloth for a mattress, and it's a plaguey rough board here. Feeling of the knots and, <coughs> knots and notches. <coughs> but wait a bit, Scramshander. I've got a carpenter's plane there in the bar. Wait, I say, and I'll make ye snug enough. So saying, he procured the plane, and with his old silk handkerchief, first dusting the bench, vigorously set to planing away at my bed, the while grinning like an ape. The shavings flew right and left, till at last the plain iron came bump against an indestructible knot. The landlord was, still sp was near spraining his wrist, and I told him, for heaven's sake, to quit. The bed was soft enough to suit me, and I did not know how all the planing in the world could make eider down of a pine plank. So gathering up the shavings with another grin, and throwing them into the great stove in the middle of the room, he went about his business and left me in a brown study. I now took measure of the bench and found that it was a foot too short, but that could be mended with a chair. But it was a foot too narrow, and the other bench in the room was about four inches higher than the planed one, so there was no yoking them. I then placed the first bench lengthwise along the only clear space against the wall, leaving a little interval between for my back to settle down in. 
and I soon found that there came such a draft of cold air over me from under the sill from the window, and both together under the sill of the window, that this plan could never do at all, especially as another current from the rickety door met the one from the window, and both together formed a series of small whirlwinds in the immediate vicinity of the spot where I had thought to spend the night. The devil fetched that harpooner, thought I, but stop. Couldn't I steal a march on him, bolt his door inside and jump into his bed, not to be wakened by the most violent knockings? It seemed no bad idea, but upon second thoughts, I dismissed it. For who could tell what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to knock me down. Still, looking around me again and seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night unless in some other person's bed, I began to think that after all, I might be cherishing unwarrantable prejudices against this unknown harpooner. Thinks I, I'll wait a while. He must be dropping in before long. I'll have a good look at him, and perhaps we may become jolly good bedfellows after all. There's no telling. But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes and going to bed, yet no sign of my harpooner. Landlord, said I, what sort of a chap is he? Does he always keep such late hours? It was now hard upon 12 o'clock. The landlord chuckled again with his lean chuckle and seemed to be mightily tickled at something beyond my comprehension. No, he answered. He's generally an early bird, early to bed, early to rise. Yes, he's the bird that catches the worm. But tonight he went out of peddling, you see, and I don't see what on earth keeps him so late unless maybe he can't sell his head. Can't sell his head? What sort of a bamboozling story is this you are telling me? Getting into a towering rage. Do you pretend to say, landlord, that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around this town? That's precisely it, said the landlord. And I told him he couldn't sell it here. That market's overstocked. With what, shouted I. With heads, to be sure. Ain't there too many heads in the world? Tell you what it is, landlord, said I, quite calmly. You'd better stop spinning that yarn to me. I'm not green. Maybe not, taking out a stick and whittling a toothpick. But I rather guess you'll be done brown if that air harpooner hears you a slander in his head. I'll break it for him, said I, now flying into a passion, again at this unaccountable farrago of the landlord's. It's broke already, said he. Broke, said I. Broke, you mean? Certain, and that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess. <clears throat> Landlord, said I, going up to him as cool as, Mr. as Mount Helka in a snowstorm. Landlord, stop whittling. You and I must understand one another, and that too without delay. I come to your house and want a bed. You tell me you can only give me half one, that the other half belongs to a certain harpooner. And about this harpooner, whom I have not yet seen, you persist in telling me the most mystifying and exasperating stories, tending to beget in me an uncomfortable feeling towards the man when you design for my bedfellow. A sort of connection, landlord, which is an intimate and confidential one in the highest degree. I now demand of you to speak out and tell me who and what this harpooner is, and whether I shall be in all respects safe to spend the night with him. And in the first place, you will be so good as to unsay that story about selling his head, which, if true, I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with a madman. And you, sir, you, I mean, landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly, would thereby render yourself liable to criminal prosecution. Well, said the landlord, fetching a long breath, that's a purty sermon for a chap that rips a little now and then. But be easy, be easy. This here harpooner I have been telling you of you, 
has just arrived from the South Seas where he bought up a lot of bombed New Zealand heads. Great curios, you know. And he's sold all on them but one. And that one he's trying to sell tonight, because tomorrow is Sunday. And it would not do to be selling human heads about the streets when folks is going to church. He wanted to last Sunday, but I stopped him, just as he was going out of the door with four heads strung on a string. For all the for all the earth like a string of onions. This account cleared up the otherwise unaccountable mystery and showed that the landlord, after all, had no idea of fooling me. But at the same time, what could I think of a harpooner who stayed out of a Saturday night, clean into the Holy Sabbath, engaged in such a cannibal business as selling the heads of idolaters? Idolators. Depending upon it, landlord, the harpooner is a dangerous man. He pays regular, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting dreadful late. You had better be turning flukes. It's a nice bed. Sal and me slept in their bed one, the night we were spliced. There's plenty of room for two to kick about in that bed. It's an almighty big bed, that. Why, afore we gave it up, Sal used to put our Sam and little Johnny in the foot of it. But I got a dreaming and sprawling about one night, and somehow Sam got pitched on the floor and came near breaking his arm. After that, Sal said it wouldn't do. Come along here, I'll give ye glim and a jiffy. And so saying, he lighted a candle and held it towards me, offering to lead the way. But I stood irresolute when looking at a clock in the corner, he exclaimed, I vote it's Sunday. You won't see that harpooner tonight. He's come to anchor somewhere. Come along then, do come, won't you come? I considered the matter a moment, and then up the stairs we went and I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big enough indeed for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. There, said the landlord, placing the candle on a crazy old sea chest that did double duty as a washstand and a center table. There, make yourself comfortable now, and good night to ye. I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. Folding back the counterpane, I stooped over the bed. Though none of the most elegant, it yet stood the scrutiny tolerably well. I then glanced around the room, and besides the bedstead and center table, could see no other furniture belonging to the place, but a rude shelf, the four walls, and a papered fireboard representing a man striking a whale. Of things not properly belonging to the room, there was a hammock lashed up and thrown upon the floor in one corner. Also a large seaman's bag containing the harpooner's wardrobe, no doubt, in lieu of a land trunk. Likewise, there was a parcel of outlandish bone, bone fish hooks on the shelf over the fireplace and a tall harpoon standing at the head of the bed. But what is this on the chest? I took it up and held it close to the light and felt it and smelt it and tried every way possible to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion concerning it. I can compare it to nothing but a large doormat, ornamented at the edges with little tinkling tags, something like the stained porcupine quills round an Indian moccasin. There was a hole or slit in the middle of this mat, the same as in South American ponchos. But could it be possible that any sober harpooner would get into a doormat and parade the streets of any Christian town in that sort of guise? I put it on to try it and it weighed me down like a hamper, being uncommonly shaggy and thick, and I thought a little damp, as though this mysterious harpooner had been wearing it of a rainy day. I went up in it to a bit of glass stuck against the wall, and I never saw such a sight in my life. I tore myself out of it in such a hurry that I gave myself a kink in the neck. I sat down on the side of the bed and commenced thinking about this head-peddling harpooner and his doormat. After thinking some time on the bedside, I got up and took off my monkey jacket and then stood in the middle of the room thinking. I then took off my coat and thought a little more in my shirt sleeves, but beginning to feel very cold now, half undressed as I was and remembering what the landlord said about the harpooners not coming home at all that night, it being so very late, I made no more ado but jumped out of my pantaloons and boots and then, blowing out the light, tumbled into bed and commended myself to the care of heaven. Whether that mattress was stuffed with corn cobs or broken crockery, there is no telling, but I rolled about a good deal and could not sleep for a long time. 
As I slid off the light to a light doze and had pretty nearly made a good offing towards the end towards the land of Nod, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage and saw a glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. Lord save me, thinks I. That must be the harpooner, the infernal head peddler. But I lay perfectly still and resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light in one hand and that identical New Zealand head in the other, the stranger entered the room and without looking towards the bed, placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner and then began working at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned around when, good heavens, what a sight, such a face. It was of a dark purplish yellow color here and there stuck over with large blackish looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is just out from the surgeon. But at that moment, he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stains of some sort or other. At first, I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man, a, a whale man too, who falling among the ca cannibals had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner in the course of his distant voyages must have met with a similar adventure. And what it is, I thought, after all, it's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin. But then, what to make of his unearthly complexion? That part of it, I mean, lying round about and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning. But I never heard of a hot sun's tanning a white man into a purplish yellow one. However, I had never been in the South Seas, and perhaps there the sun produced these extraordinary effects upon the skin. Now, while all these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this harpooner never noticed me at all. But after some difficulty opening his bag, he commenced fumbling in it and presently pulled out a sort of a tomahawk and a sealskin wallet with the hair on. Placing these on the old chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, a ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat a new beaver hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head, none to speak of at least, nothing but a small scalp knot twisted up on his forehead. His bald purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than I ever bolted at dinner. Even as it was, I thought something of slipping out the window, but it was the second floor back. I'm no coward, but what to make of this head peddling purple rascal altogether past my comprehension. Ignorance is the parent of fear and being completely nonplussed and confounded about the stranger, I confessed I was now as much afraid of him as if it was the devil himself who had thus broken into my room at the dead of night. In fact, I was so afraid of him that I was not game enough just then to address him 
and demand a satisfactory answer concerning what seemed inexplicable in him. Meanwhile, he continued the business of undressing and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face. His back, too, was all over the same dark squares. He seemed to have been in a 30 years war and just escaped from it with a sticking plaster shirt. Still more, his very legs were marked as if a parcel of dark green frogs were running up the trunks of young palms. It was now quite plain that he must be some abominable savage or other shipped aboard of a whaleman in the South Seas and so landed in this Christian country. I quaked to think of it. A peddler of heads too, perhaps the heads of his brothers. He might take a fancy to mine. Heavens, look at that tomahawk. But there was no time for shuddering. For now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy Greco or Rapal or Dreadnought, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pockets and produced at length a curious little deformed image with a hunch on its back and exactly the color of a three days old Congo baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby preserved in some similar matter. But seeing that it was not at all limber and that glistened a good deal like polished ebony, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol which indeed it proved to be. For now, the savage goes up to the empty fireplace and removing the papered fireboard, sets up this little hunched back image, like a ten pin between the andirons. The chimney lambs and all the bricks inside were very sooty, so that I thought this fireplace made an appropriate little shrine or chapel for his Congo idol. I now screwed my eyes hard toward the half-hidden image, feeling but ill at ease meantime to see what next to follow. First, he takes a double handful of shavings out of his Greco pocket and places them carefully before the idol. Then, laying a bit of ship biscuit on top and applying the flame from the lamp, he kindled the shavings into a sacrificial blaze. Presently, after many ha hasty snatches into the fire and still hastier withdrawals of his finger, whereby he seemed to be scorching them badly, he at last succeeded in drawing out the biscuit. Then blowing off the heat and ashes a little, he made a polite offering of it to the little Negro. But the little devil did not seem to fancy such dry sort of fare at all. He never moved his lips. All these strange antics were accomplished by still stranger guttural noises from the devotee, who seemed to be praying in a sing-song or else singing some pagan psalmody or other, during which his face twitched about in a most unnatural manner. At last extinguishing the flame, he took the idol up very unceremoniously and bagged it again in his Greco pocket as carefully, carelessly as if he were a sportsman bagging a dead woodcock. All these queer proceedings increased my uncomfortableness and seeing him now exhibiting strong symptoms of concluding his business operations and jumping into bed with me, I thought it was high time now or never, before the light was put out, to break the spell into which I had so long been bound. 
but the interval I spent deliberating what to say was a fatal one. Taking up his tomahawk from the table, he examined ahead of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, his mouth on the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment, the light was extinguished, and this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out. I could not help it now, and giving a sudden grunt of astonishment, he began feeling me. Stammering out something I knew not what, I rolled away from him against the wall and conjured him, whoever or whatever he may be, to keep quiet and to let me get up and light the lamp again. But his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning. Who e double you? he said at last. You no speaky. Damn me, I kill ye. And so saying, the light of tomahawk began flourishing around me in the dark. Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin, shouted I. Landlord, watch, Coffin, angels, save me. Speaky, telling me who ye be, or damn ye, I kill ye, again growled the cannibal, while his horrid flourishings of the tomahawk scattered the hot tobacco ashes about me till I thought my linen would light on fire. But thank heaven, at that moment, the landlord came into the room, light in hand, and leaping for the bed, I ran up to him. Don't be afraid now, said he, grinning again. Quebec here won't harm a hair of your head. Stop your grinning, shouted I, and why didn't you tell me that the infernal Hapuna was a cannibal? I thought ye knew it, didn't I tell ye? He was peddling heads about town. But turn flukes again and go to sleep. Creeby, look here. You sobby me? I sobby you. This man sleepy you. You sobby? Me sobby plenty, grunted Creeby, puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. You get in, he added, motioning to me with his tomahawk and throwing the clothes to one side. He really did this in not only a civil, but a really kindly and charitable way. I stood looking at him a moment. For all his tattooings, he was on the whole a clean, comely looking cannibal. What's all this fuss about I have been making about, thought to myself. This man's a human being, just as I am. And he has as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there or pipe, or whatever you call it, and tell him to stop, sm stop smoking. In short, I will turn in with him, but I don't fancy a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous, and besides, I ain't insured. This being told to Quebec, he at once complied, and again politely motioned me to get in bed, rolling over to one side as much to say, I won't touch a leg of ye. Good night, landlord, said I, you may go. I turned in and never slept better in my life. Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of old little parti colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure no two parts of which were of one precise shade, owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade, his shirt sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times. The same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt. They so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Quiqued was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar circumstance that befell me. Whether it was a reality or a dream, I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney as I had seen a little sweep do a few days 
previous. And my stepmother, who somehow or other was all the time whipping me or sending me to bed supperless. My mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st of June, the longest day of the year in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully, but there was no help for it. So upstairs, I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and with a bitter sigh, got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating that 16 hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. 16 hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light too, the sun shining in at the window in a great rattling of coaches in the streets and the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse. At last I got up dressed and softly going down in my stocking feet, sought out my stepmother and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior anything indeed but condemning me to lie abed such an unendurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of the stepmothers and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze. And slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams, I opened my eyes and before the sunlit gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition state, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had been a small degree civilized, he very probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then if he had been still a salvage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last, he emerged with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes and began creaking and limping about the room as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now that there was no curtains to the window and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queequeg made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning, any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his evolutions to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat and taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was watching to see where he kept his razor when lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall begins a vigorous scraping or rather harpooning of his cheeks. Thinks I, Queequeg, this is using Raj's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards, I wondered the less at this operation when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. Chapter 5. 
breakfast. I quickly followed suit and descending into the bar room, accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly. I cherished no malice towards him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing. The more is the pity. So if any one man, in his own proper person, affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The bar room was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in the night previous, and whom I had not as yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates and second mates, and third mates, and sea carpenters, and sea coopers, and sea blacksmiths, and harpooners, and ship keepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly tell how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue, and would seem to smell almost as musky. He cannot have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That man next to him looks a few shades lighter. You might say a touch of satin wood is in him. In the complexion of a third still lingers a tropic tawn, but slightly bleached withal. He doubtless has tarried whole weeks ashore, but who could show a cheek like Queequeg, which, barred with various tints, seem like the Andes' western slope to show forth in one array contrasting climates, zone by zone. Gung-ho, now cried the landlord, flinging open the door, and in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, the great New England traveler, and Mungo Park, the Scotch one, of all men they possess the least assurance in the parlor. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs, as Ledyard did, or the taking a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the Negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances, this kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections just here are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small surprise, nearly every man maintained a profound silence. And not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea dogs, many of whom without the slightest Bashfulness had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking. And yet here they sat at a social breakfast table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Queequeg, why Queequeg sat there among them, at the head of the table, too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it, to the imminent jeopardy of many heads, and grappling the beefsteaks towards him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and everyone knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls, and has applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare. Enough that when breakfast was over, he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on when I sallied out for a stroll. Chapter 6, The Street If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. 
and thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, and at Bombay and the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scared the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street and Wapping. In these last mentioned haunts, you see only sailors. But in New Bedford, actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones on holy flesh. It makes a stranger stare. But besides the Fijians, the Tonga Torborars, the Uramangoans, the Panagians, and the Brigians, and besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which unheeded reel about the streets, you will see other sites still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in this town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshiremen, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young of stalwart frames, fellows who have felled force and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lance. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. In some things you, you'd think them but a few hours old. Look there, that chap strutting around the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallowtail coat girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here comes another with a southwestern bombazine cloak. No town bred dandy will compare with a country bred one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. And bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas trousers. Ah, poor hayseed. How bitterly world burst those straps in the first howling gale, when thou art driven, straps, buttons and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals, and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still, New Bedford is a queer place. Had it not been for us whalemen, that tract of land would this day perhaps have been as howling in a condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her backcountry are enough to frighten one. They look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest to live in, in all New England. It is a land of oil, true enough, but not like Canaan. A land also of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with eggs. Yet, in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. Whence they came? How planted upon this once scraggy scory of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all of these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can Herr Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for dowers to their daughters and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles. In summertime, the town is sweet to see, full of fine maples, long avenues of green and gold. And in August, high in the air, the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts, cantilaberwise proffer the passerbys their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which in many a district of New Bedford has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford, they bloom like their own red roses. But roses only bloom in the summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match that bloom of theirs ye cannot, save in Salem, where they tell me the young girls breathe such musk, their sailor sweethearts smell them miles offshore, as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Malacca's instead of the Puritanic sands. Chapter 7, The Chapel. In this same New Bedford, 
there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshiper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the wall on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I, not, but I do not pretend to quote. The first tablet, sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who at age 18 was lost overboard near the Isle of Desolation off Patagonia. November 1st, 1836, this tablet is erected in his memory by his sister. The second tablet, sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Canney, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleig, forming one of the boat's crews of the ship Eliza, who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific. December 31st, 1839. This marble is placed by their surviving shipmates. And the third tablet, sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy, who in the bows of his boat was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan. August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door and turning sideways was surprised to see Queequeg near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance because he was the only one who could not read and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall. Whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not. But so many are the unrecorded accidents in the fishery, and so plainly did several women present wear the countenance, if not the trappings, of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. O oh, ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who standing among flowers can say, here, here lies my beloved. Ye know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black bordered marbles which cover no ashes. What despair in those immovable inscriptions. What deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave. As well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elephanta as here. In what census of living creatures, the dead of mankind are included? Why is it that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the Goodwin Sands? 
how it is that to his name, who yesterday departed for the other world, we prefix, prefix so significant and infidel a word, and yet do not thus entitle him, if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth, why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals, in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique Adam, who died 60 round centuries ago. How it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss. Why all the living so strive to hush all the dead? Wherefore, but the rumor of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city. All these things are not without their meanings. But faith, like a jackal, feeds among the tombs, and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope. It needs scarcely to be told with what feelings on the eve of a Nantucket voyage I regarded those marble tablets, and by the murky light of that darkened, doleful day read the fate of the whalemen who had gone before me. Yes, Ishmael, the same fate may be thine. But somehow I grew merry again. Delightful inducements to embark, fine chance for promotion. It seems I, a stove boat, will make me an immortal by brevet. Yes, there is death in this business of whaling, a speechlessly quick, chaotic bundling of a man into eternity. But what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual, we are too much like oysters observing the sun through the water and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the, but the lees of my better being. In fact, take my body who will. Take it, I say. It is not me. And therefore, three cheers for Nantucket, and come a stove boat and stove body when they will, for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. Chapter 8, The Pulpit. I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately as the storm-pelted door flew back upon him, admitting him, a quick regardful eyeing of him by all the congregation sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapple was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering youth. For among all the fissures of his wrinkles, there shone certain mild gleams of a newly developing bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath February's snow. No one having previously heard his history could for the first time behold Father Mapple without the utmost interest because there were certain engrafted clerical peculiarities about him, imputable to that adventurous maritime he had led. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella and certainly had not come in his carriage for his tarpaulin hat ran down with melting sleet and his great pilot cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat and coat and overshoes were one by one removed and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner when arrayed, arrayed by a decent suit, he quietly approached the pulpit. Like most old fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one and since a regular stairs to such a height would by its long angle with the floor seriously contract the already small area of the chapel, 
the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mappel and finished the pulpit without a stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder, like those in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. The wife of a whaling cabin, the wife of a whaling captain had provided the chapel with a handsome pair of red worsted man ropes for this ladder, which, being itself nicely headed and stained with a mahogany color, the whole contrivance, considering of what manner of chapel it was, seemed no, by no means in bad taste. Halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder, and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the man ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards, and then with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the steps as if ascending the main top of his vessel. The perpendicular parts of this side ladder, as is usually the case with swinging ones, were of cloth-covered rope. Only the rounds were of wood, so that at every step there was a joint. At my first glimpse of the pulpit, it had not escaped me that however convenient for a ship, these joints in the present instance seemed unnecessary for I was not prepared to see Mother, Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn around and stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered for some time without fully comprehending the reason for this. Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of the stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be then that by that act of physical isolation, he signifies his spiritual, his spiritual withdrawal for the time? from all outwardly worldly ties and connections. Yes, for replenished with the meat and wine of the word, to the faithful man of God, this pulpit, I see, is a self-containing stronghold, a lofty Adenbreitstein with a perennial well of water within the walls. But the side ladder was not the only strange feature of the place, borrowed, by the chapter, borrowed from the chaplain's former seafarings, between the marble cenotaphs on either side of the pulpit, the wall which formed its back was adorned with a large painting representing a gallant ship beating against a terrible storm off a lee coast of black rocks and snowy breakers. But high above the flying scud and dark rolling clouds, there floated a little isle of sunlight from which beamed forth an angel's face. And this bright face shed a distinct spot of radiance on the ship's tossed deck, something like the silver plate now inserted into the victory's plank where Nelson fell. Ah, noble ship, the angel seemed to say. Beat on, beat on, thou noble ship, and bear a hardy helm, for lo, the sun is breaking through, the clouds are rolling off, serenest azure is at hand. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter in the picture. Its paneled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested upon a projected piece of scroll work, fashioned after a, f a ship's fiddlehead beak. What could be more of meaning? For the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence, it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence, it is the God of breezes, fair and foul, is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. Chapter 9, A Sermon. 
Father Mapple rose, and in a mild voice of unassuming authority, ordered the scattered people to condense. Starboard, gangway. Sideway to larboard. Larboard, gangway to starboard. Midships, midships. There was a low rumbling of heavy sea boots among the benches, and still a slighter shuffling of women's shoes, and all was quiet again, and every eye was on the preacher. He paused a little, then kneeling in the pulpit's bows, folded his large brown hands across his chest, uplifted his closed eyes, and offered a prayer so deeply devout that he seemed kneeling and praying at the bottom of the sea. This ended in prolonged solemn tones, like the continual tolling of a bell in a ship that is foundering at sea in a fog. In such tones, he commenced reading the following hymn, but changing his manner toward the concluding stanzas, burst forth with appealing exultation and joy. singing this hymn, which swelled high above the howling of the storm. A brief pause ensued. The preacher slowly turned over the leaves of the Bible, and at last, folding his hand down on the proper page, said, Beloved shipmates, clench the last verse of the first chapter of Jonah, and God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Shipmates, this book, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. Yet what depths of the soul does Jonah's deep sea line sound? What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet. What a noble thing is this canticle in the fish's belly. How billow-like and boisterously grand. We feel the flood surging over us. We sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is this lesson that the book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it's a two-stranded lesson. A lesson to all of us as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men, it's a lesson to us all, because it is a story of sin, hard-heartedness, suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance, prayers, and finally, the deliverance and joy of Jonah. As with all sinners among men, the sin of this son of Amittai, 
was in his willful disobedience to the command of God. Never mind now what that command was or how conveyed, which he found a hard command. But all the things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence, he often commands us that endeavors to persuade. If we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. With this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharfs of Joppa and seeks a ship that's bound for Tarshish. There lurks, perhaps, a hitherto unheeded meeting here. By all accounts, Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. Cadiz is in Spain, as far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days, when the Atlantic was almost an unknown sea, because Joppa, the modern Jaffa shipmates, is on the most easterly coast of the Mediterranean, the Syrian, the Tashish or Cadiz, more than 2,000 miles to the westward from that, just outside the Straits of Gibraltar. See ye not, then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee worldwide from God. Miserable man, almost contemptible and worthy of all scorn, with slouched hat and guilty eye skulking from his God, prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas, so disordered, self-condemning in his look, that had there been policemen in those days, Jonah, on the mere suspicion of something wrong, had been arrested ere to touch the deck. How plainly he's a fugitive. No baggage, not a hat box, valise, or carpet bag. No friends accompany him to the wharf with their adieu. At last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarsha ship receiving the last items of her cargo. And as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors, for the moment, desist from hoisting in the goods to mock the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look all ease and confidence. In vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the man assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In this gamesome but still serious way, one whispers to the other, Jack, he's robbed a widow. Or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist. Or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah. Or belike one of the missing murderers from Sodom. Another runs to read the bill that stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering 500 gold coins for the apprehension, apprehension of a parasite. And continuing a description of this person, he reads and looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd around Jordan, prepared to lay their hands upon him. Frightened, Jonah trembles, and summoning all his boldness to his face, only looks so much more a coward. He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion. So he makes the best of it. And when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, they let him pass, and he descends into the cabin. Who's there, cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for customs. Who's there? Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah. For the instant, he almost turns to flee again, but he rallies. I seek a passage in the ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far, the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him. But no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide. At last, he slowly answered, still intently eyeing him. No sooner, sir? Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha! Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from that scent. I'll sail with ye, he. He says, the passage money, how much is that? I'll pay now. For his particularly written shipmates, 
as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history, that he paid the fare thereof ere the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Now, Jonah's captain, shipmates, was one of those discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. In this world, shipmate, sin that pays its way can travel freely and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. So Jonah's captain prepares the test, the length of Jonah's purse, ere he judge him openly. He charges him thrice the usual sum, and it's assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah is a fugitive, but at the same time results, resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold. Yet when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, the prudent suspicions still molest the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger anyway, he mutters, and Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah. I'm travel weary. I need sleep. Thou looks like it, says the captain. There's thy room. Jonah enters and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling in there, the captain laughs slowly to himself and mutters something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then in that contracted hole, sunk to beneath the ship's waterline, Jonah feels the heralded presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels. Screwed as its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slights slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship, heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flame and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room. Though in truth, infallibly straight itself, it but made obvious the false lying levels from which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah, as lying in his berth, his tormented eyes roll around the place, and this thus far successful fugitive finds no restful, no rest for his glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, the side are all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans. Straight upward, so it burns. But the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Like one who, after a night of drunken revelry, hies to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse but so much the more strike his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be passed, then at last, among the world of woe he feels, a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death, for conscience is the wound, and there's not to staunch it. So after sore wrestlings in his birth, Jonah's progeny of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come. The ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf, the uncheered ship, Fatashish, all careening, glides to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea rebels. He will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on. The ship is like to break, but now when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her, when boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard, when the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling, and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head, in all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps. His head is asleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers, and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Aye, shipmates, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, a berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him and shrieks in his dead ear, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise? Startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet and stumbling to the deck, 
grasps a shroud to look out upon the sea. But at that moment, he is sprung upon by a panther bill leaping over the bulwarks. Wave after wave thus leaps into the ship and finding no speedy vent, runs roaring fore and aft till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat. And ever as the white moon shows a frighted face from the steep gullies and the blackness overhead, aghast Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beating downward again towards the tormented deep. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. In all his cringing attitudes, the god fugitive is now too plainly known. The sailors mark him. More and more certain grow their suspicions of him, and at last, fully to test the truth, by referring the whole matter to high heaven, they fall to casting lots to see whose cause this great tempest was upon them. The lot is Jonas. That discovered then how furiously they mob him with their questions. What is thine occupation? Whence comes thou? Thy country? What people? But mark now, my shipmates, the behavior of poor Jonah. The eager manners, but ask, mariners, but ask him who he is and where from whereas they not only receive and answer those questions, but likewise another answer to question not put by them. By the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. I am a Hebrew, he cries, and then I fear the Lord God of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah? I will much thou fear the Lord God then. Straighten away, he now goes on to make a full confession, whereupon the mariners become more and more appalled, but still a pitiful. For when Jonah yet, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but knew too well the darkness of his deserts, when wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that for his sake this great tempest was upon them, they mercifully turn apart from him and seek by other means to save the ship, but all in vain. The indignant gales howls longer, louder, then with one hand raised invoking to God, with the other they not only unreluctantly lay hand of Jonah. And now behold Jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea, when instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east, and the sea is still as Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind. He goes down in the whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him, and the whale shoots to all his ivy teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly. But observe his prayer and learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. He leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting with himself with this, that despite all of his pains and pangs, he will still look towards his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin, but I do place him before you as a model of repentance. Sin not, but if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. While he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without seemed to add new power to the preacher, who when describing Jonah's sea storm seemed tossed by a storm himself. His deep chest heaved as with a ground spell. His tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away off his swarthy brow and the light leaping from his eye made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. There now came a lull in his look as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more, and at last, standing motionless with closed eyes for the moment, seemed communing with God and himself. But again, he leaned over towards the people and bowing his head lowly with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility he spake these words. 
Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you. Both his hands press upon me. I have read ye by what murky light may be mine the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners. And therefore to ye and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than ye. And now how gladly would I come down from this masthead and sit on the hatches there where you sit and listen as you listen while one of you reads the Emmy, reads me that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to me as a pilot of the living God. How being an anointed pilot, prophet, and speaker of true things, and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission and sought to escape his duty and his God by taking ship at Joppa. But God is everywhere. Tarsha, she never reached. And as we have seen, God came upon him in the whale and swallowed him down to living gulfs of doom and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the sea where the eddying depths sucked him 10,000 fathoms down and the weeds were wrapped around his head and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet then beyond the reach of any plummet out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then God heard the engulfed, repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea, the whale came breaching up towards the warm and pleasant sound, and all the delights of air and earth, and vomited Jonah upon the dry land. When the word of the Lord came a second time, and Jonah bruised and beaten, his ears like two seashells still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This shipmates is this other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him to whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him, as the great pilot Paul has, has it, while preaching to others, he himself is cast away. He dropped and fell away from himself for a moment. Then lifting his face to them again, showed a deep joy in his eyes, as he cried out with a heavenly enthusiasm. But, O oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe, there is sure delight. And the higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. Is not the main truck and higher than the calcium is low? Delight is to him a far, far upward and inward delight who against the proud gods and commodores of this earth ever stands forth his own inexorable self. Delight is to him whose strong arms yet support him when the ship of this base treacherous world has gone down beneath him. Delight is to him who gives no quarter in the truth and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top gallant delight is to him who acknowledges no law or Lord, but the Lord his God and is only a patriot to heaven. Delight is to him whom all the waves of the bills of the sea of the boisterous mob can never shake from this sure keel of the ages. An eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who coming to lay down, lay him down, can say with his final breath, O Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine, more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee. For what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? He said no more, but slowly waving a benediction, covered his face with his hands, and so remained kneeling till all the people had departed and he was left alone in the place. <laughs> 